Long way away. Far away, distant place. Then people come here to gather and share the stories of the people and the people before them and the people before them again. Now, you were a hundred years old last Saturday. Yeah. And you had all your family give you a big birthday party. Yeah. And you've got three sons and one daughter. Yeah. You're a big mob. Big mob. <laughs> you can take this off now. You. Beautiful. I'm Michael Butler, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. For the past 15 years I've been filming a documentary around Australia titled The Message Stick Vehicle. As I journeyed around I had different prolific artists paint on this vehicle with prime ministers to politicians, rock stars, tennis players, movie stars, um, incredible artists and incredible elders who'd been a part of the journey. And I'd had Jack Thompson narrate the film. What better symbol of that than this message. The message stick vehicle has now become a new Dreamtime story, painted by well over 200 Aboriginal language groups in Australia. It has truly taken on a life of its own. The message stick vehicle has now been exhibited in five major museums around Australia as a significant art piece and has taken over 10 years to paint. Getting the bull bar put on, spotties, modified the engine and put a six cylinder motor, missing five speed gearbox and a Salisbury diff. New tyres, new suspension, I think she's a bloody beaut for Australia mate. A lovely stick in the hole and water into there. Very strong, never break down. Yep, very reliable. I'm just going to paint it now. Get new tyres on one day. This is our home. I bought a 1961 ex army ambulance Land Rover. It served in the Vietnam War, and I rebuilt it for a trip of a lifetime with my girlfriend. Well, I'll show my little Shelly this tonight. <laughs> After living in Sydney, I'm becoming frustrated with city life. I want to have a real outback adventure while documenting and filming my journey around Australia. I have a great passion for playing the didgeridoo and want to meet the traditional Aboriginal elder of this ancient instrument. To keep them safe on the journey around Australia, they have the Rainbow Serpent painted on the vehicle by famous Aboriginal artist and musician Colin Wollongari McCormack. My grandfather, Albert Namajira, inspired me. I was given a set of paints and uh, I never used them for a whole year. And then one day it was raining and I had nothing to do, so I bought some canvases and once I painted my first painting, it was like I caught a bug, you know, and I had to paint every day. They feel the vehicle is protected now. They have only $300 and a digital camera. They don't know how long the journey will take or who they'll meet along the way. They just know they're heading north. Southwest Rocks, huh? Southwest Rocks. We found out that the local tribe for this region was Warami. We settled down on their land for the first night on the road. Simple vegetables are the best, aren't they, Shell? Uh, well, it's a bit cool. The temperature's gone down a bit, so some... Uh... Butter with sweet potato is our dinner tonight. 
Bit of gravy on top. Superb. Super? Yeah. Where to today? <laughs> Wherever the road takes us. <laughs> Michael and Michelle head north through Gumbanga land and learn some of their tragic history. That's OK. All right. That's OK. Where are we off to? Well, there's some sacred sites around here at um, South Ballina. When the white man started coming through all of this area, he um, obviously didn't like the Aboriginal tribes being on the land. So what he did is he um, took them over to one of the sand dunes not far from here and shot them all. There's bones up there which have been covered up by, by, by sand drift and vegetation. And uh, national parks and police came to the scene and they, they uh, examined this area and found out that it was an Aboriginal campsite. And, and these stones is what, what they used here to work with. Potch. Potch. Yeah, it's like glass. And, and they, they, they obviously brought that here and, and they, they, they chip it with the stones and they'd, they'd, they'd use that for their carvings and their making spears. We'll have a look at the midden up here. It, it, most of it's been covered up by vegetation. There's stone axes in this. So you can imagine how far back in history this must be. It had to be thousands of years. Of course, nobody will ever land or excavate to find out. Being, you know, being probably the sacred site. They'd have the, the abundance of pippies and, and wildlife, wallabies, kangaroos, and a perfect little sheltered area through here. You, you get a strange feeling if you're here late in the evening or it's nightfall. It does things to you. That's the site. It goes way back, way back in time. Oh, it was amazing. Pippying area when the mullet was running, this, this land was just plentiful. It was a happening place. <laughs> it was beautiful. Well, we're off to go and see Uncle Eric now. Yes. Yeah. They head into Bunjalung country. This was a place, I do believe, that when the Bible speaks of, it's the land of milk and honey. Fruit, fresh meat, fresh tucker every day. When they get up in the morning, they're at a place where they'd meet with the elders, the elder woman, they'd come out there and they'd stand there, get up there for the morning drill, right? Who goes out for fish this morning? Who's going to go for Dullum? They had their fishermen's experience. They supplied the needy, to look after the needy ones first. Then after they sheared them all around, Malagana, the old hilders would get theirs, then the huntmen would get theirs last. That was a part of our laws. Now, these are laws. It was loving, giving, sharing, and caring. There was no greed. This is where the spirit used to roam around here with our people. And it's still here today. Yeah. Uncle Eric kindly painted his name on my didgeridoo. I'm going down, y'all. Thank it's you. Okay. I'd taken this didgeridoo to Mount Everest, and now, two years later, my goal is to find the traditional master player of this sacred instrument somewhere in Arnhem Land. He gave us a special blessing for our 2,000 kilometre journey to the Northern Territory. They welcomed us into their family, and now we're part of the family. It's beautiful. Well, this is downtown Byron Bay as quiet and serene as Byron Bay could be. A bit further up the road, still in Bunjalung country, they stop at the most easterly point of Australia and find out that this area has had a land claim placed on it by the traditional owners, the Kay sisters. I didn't even know there was any Aboriginal team or They asked where you from, sister girl. Yeah. And I'd say here, and I'd go where, and I'd go here, Byron. <laughs> we did the... Um genealogy, we were right back uh, to show that they were here when the first settlers came. It was their family group that lived here. So we've got all that documented so that it's indisputable, you know, that these are the native title holders. And recognise that there were people here that owned the land before 
before whitefellas came along and stole it. Some people, they think we want to own Byron Bay in itself, the whole lot. We don't want to do that. No, that's not... Because, see, the people, they're building and coming this way, like, you know, see all those there, they? they're coming this way into the town. But they just want to leave Cozy Corn to Broken Head alone, yeah. along the beach side over there, Teller Beach. Yeah. That should that's be that's mine. Way. Where's we saw? That's where our grandparents were met, were buried. So we, uh, that's the land I'd like to get back to. There's no chance of that. Uh, because they were buried there. And where they were buried, they got a big swimming pool there. And goodness knows what happened to their, you know, bones and things. I left with a very heavy heart, knowing what my white ancestors had done but we're happy to find out that the Iraqwal land claim was successful. We travelled on to the Gold Coast to meet my family. My grandfather, <coughs> Keith Dudman. This park has been named in honour of Mr Keith Dudman. He was one of the major land developers of the area and contributed much towards the residential and commercial development of the Miami area. I was four years old when my parents separated and 21 when my dad died of cancer. Do you miss him? I don't know, Shell. That's a strange question you ask. You know, I never, I never had a father to miss. Deep in my heart, I would have liked to have known him. Some people get the chance to have a full family, and some people don't. And I was one of them. positive images of Aboriginal Australia today or Indigenous Australia today and we'd like to um, be part of the community based and um, fight anti-racism in Australia today and that's what brought us here today and we'd like to document people like yourselves and other of our brothers and sisters um, as well as mainstream Australia and gather today and yeah so here we are. I think it's good because there's a lot of people around and all that. Yes, yeah, be proud of ourselves, and our culture. Good on you guys. It's going to be a big rush for us too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Good things to get to you yesterday from the Gala Yabri Dance Room. from around the Rome area. The work I'd done on the truck with Michael was some stencil work, which is a traditional way of painting from my area. Because a lot of that oak is crushed up, uh, mixed with water and, and blown from the mouth. So that's how we produce the images on the four-wheel drive. We passed by Bachelor in Yowie country to get to the tropical destination of Nauachi. In Townsville, they meet a dance troupe, Malu Bezam, that originated in the Torres Strait Islands. Here in this dance group, we have a mixture of people because of intermarriages. We have Aboriginal blood, we have uh, Torres Strait, we have New Guinea, we have South Sea Islands, we have European. And um, we try to tell everybody that it's because everything has changed now. You know, it is, and we can't change it back. So what we do is to learn everybody about our culture because we're saying, hey, we're learning your culture. This is ours, learn ours. So we'll be able to live together. This society is a multicultural society. So, you know, we need to know each other's culture so that I could live next to that uh, person from China next door. <laughs> say a small prayer for Michelle and for you Mike and for this whole project that the Lord's hand will be upon it because you are what you're doing is, is really bringing out into the open um, through our own eyes 
and not from the eyes of someone else. Lord, we thank you for our brother and for our sister. Lord, may you just supply all their needs, Lord, whether it be financial or material or physical. Lord, you just come upon them now. Give them the mind and understanding. Give them the love and the joy and the peace, Lord, and you give them that tolerance. Lord, touch their eyes and bless the things that they see. And Lord, touch their hands and bless the things that they touch. Bless the vehicle, Lord, that they have put to this use that will just extend and promote Indigenous Australia. Guku Yalanji country is where they meet the Gosam family. They're collecting a special didgeridoo for Michael. He learns that these little termites eat out the center of the tree to make the hole for the didgeridoo. You look for the couple of dead branches in between, but it's got to have a healthy top. They haven't made it to the top yet, that's why it's still nice and green and flush. Oh, sorry, Dad. Forgot. Um, so that, that's the hollow we got from the top. He's a little bit bigger down the bottom. Well, that's going to be a good ditch. Yeah, you can hear the sound already. Warwick and his dad, Michael, have a workshop at home where they carve their totems of crocodile and goanna into the wood. He's brought us closer together. We seem to be like good mates because we're usually around each other all day in here doing our work. It's like a hobby and it's creating itself into self-employment. And if we do good in a few years' time, we'll be able to open up places for the young kids to, you know, take them out and teach them how to carve didgeridoos and teach them how to go out in the bush and chop didgeridoos. Like, there's a whole world out there to experience. Aboriginal art can take you there. Michael and Michelle are lucky enough to take their totems with them. Michael paints the crocodile on the vehicle and Warwick paints the water dragon. They're now starting to feel that the truck is taking on a life of its own. It's starting to look like a traditional Aboriginal message stick, moving between the different language groups. They feel very privileged. Michael Gosam sends them to meet David Hudson, who explains the significance of the Aboriginal spirit, which they now believe is guiding their journey. In this area, we believe that we were here first as human beings in that form. And when all the uh, things start happening, you know, the floods and the waters and uh, earthquakes and fire, we as human beings turned ourselves into trees, water, birds. And that's how come we're here today, because of Guriala, he's a giant rainbow serpent and he created all these little channels here where the water rushes out to the coast. In the top end, the didgeridoo is known as the Yiraki. I get to play with one of the masters of the Cape York region. Well, I'll do that first thing, that thing at the bottom. Uh, Did you do just there? Can you see him in the water? Careful, it's a croc in my bite. <laughs> David Yudaki playing and music has taken him all around the world. And he's also a great artist. So I want to just do some handprints for you. These handprints symbolise good spirits and my spirits travel with you, fellas, too, on your travels. The four hands are painted in red, black, white and yellow as a representation of the different colours of people around the world. Michael and Michelle leave David knowing they're heading into much more traditional land. They cross the Bloomfield River, still in Kuku Yalanji country. As they head into more remote country, Michelle becomes curious about how traditional people survived in the bush. This is a yellow walnut. Michelle gets the opportunity to meet Martha, one of a few women who know about traditional bush medicine in this region. Mm. So I was since like green mango. Mm. Mm. Since I was 16, my parents teach me how to look after myself in the rainforest. Also, just learn about bush food as well. Even when you're going up walking in the rainforest, you don't know what you'll come across, like snakes, diarrhea, also a stinging tree. Mm. It's the most very deadly plant in, in far north Queensland. If someone gets hurt in the member of the family, well then you, there's a plant that can cure it for it. If you get bitten by a snake, what you can do, 
grab a bunch of cock apple leaf, you heat two rocks up in a fire and place it on each side of the foot of the snake bite. And then place the cock apple leaf over the snake bite, the heat of the rock and the leaf forge out the venom portion. It's out like a promise. Now this is our pain downers. It's what they do. They cut this up and they paint with their totems on it. So once it's dry, you can use it as a paintbrush. Who has been your inspiration to learn about bush foods and medicines, Martha? I forced myself to, to do bush food with my grandfather because he didn't have long to live. Now, he only died last year. And, um, and I'm glad that I picked it up so very quick. And now I'm passing it down by generation to generation. They head deeper into Kunju and Angnara country to one of the biggest events in the Cape York region, the Laura Festival. It's a gathering of all the different language groups in the region. We have a regional. And we came for Crowdbury. Who's the deadliest dancer? Me! 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 I'm the deadliest dancer. I am! Can you tell us what your paintings represent on your body? This here basically that's just seagull, you know? Is this your totem? Um not my totem, but it's it's like um Palmari. The yellow represents the sun because it's very sunny over on Palm Island. And the dots represent the shells that they have laying around. We just make dancing. I just know that we are at a very crucial time in our history because all our old people are dying out and if you're not sitting down with them and learning language, song, dance, art and just spending quality time with them, you know, like when they're gone, they're gone, you know, they're gone, gone back to the earth where they come from. So it's really an important time for cultural awareness and revival. I wish I had been taught that uh, rich part of our culture to keep it going, you know, pass on, and so I'm missing that. But uh, see the kids here today, yeah, I can say that we've got a vision for our kids for the future and the restoration of our Aboriginal culture in Australia. I love dancing because I'm a dancer myself. festival that I've come to and um, I always think of it just as an absolutely um, a weekend of celebration, celebration of the sharing of culture. We actually feel an enormous uh, bonding of people, a freeness of spirit. <laughs> At the conclusion of this festival, after an eight-year land rights struggle, 58,000 hectares are handed back to the elders of the Angnara language group. Trees and rock formations ground like this one here has meaning right down to the last blade or the last leaf or rock there. All has meaning. That's why we know we own this one. The young generation do a traditional dance to celebrate the right to follow in their ancestors' footsteps and to use this land as they wish. The next destination is one of the most remote areas of Australia, Chewingy country. Ten years ago, Catherine Cockatoo built her home 40 kilometres from the nearest neighbour. She lives alone. There's not very many women that would live in a place like this and put up with something like this for that long. That amount of time, mm. I mean, you try it. <laughs> Just to come out with nothing. I believe that the spirits called me back here for something, for a purpose. I had a dream one night that these people were standing along the beach in front of the mission house and that the mission house was still standing and calling me back, just waving, just waving. So I just gave up on the city life and just moved out here and I feel that I'm a part of the bush. Very, very spiritual place, very strong. 
can feel them. You can feel them around you everywhere. Just laying down at night and just listening. It's beautiful. It's quiet. Peaceful. I wouldn't think there's anything out there in the other world. It's part of me. And I think I'm a part of it. It's such a point here. It's so... Like when, as a kid, when you draw a map of Australia and you, you draw the top and, well, here it is. And there it is. Never actually drew this little knobby bit here at the top. Well, I knew that existed. Did you? No. <laughs> Beautiful. Absolutely. <laughs> Yehajina is a language group at the top of Australia. On the next leg, they head inland into the Australian outback and travel through country that belongs to many different indigenous groups. We've made it to Northern Territory! I'll say yeah, yeah. I'll say yeah. That's the both of us. They pass through Kalkadoon country on the way to the Daly River. You've got to watch out for the crocodiles. <laughs> They cruise up and down here to the barra. But this is it for a swim. Now before the crocodiles come. <laughs> Saltwater crocodiles are a powerful indigenous totem. Local Aborigines claim their ancestors crossed swollen rivers on the back of these man-eaters. Michael and Michelle decide to take a boat. Don't film me, I feel really scared. <laughs> and we're not in a very safe boat, it's very small. Whose idea was this? I'd rather go on a tour bike. I like being a tourist. A tourist is good. This is the biggest breeding ground for saltwater crocodiles. This is really silly. See if you can get fairly close. Don't speed up and slow down like that, shall you? It makes it hard for me to film. It felt good to get back into the safety of our landy. We now move on to Larrakia country. We feel that we're nearly halfway around Australia, but we've got a few challenges ahead of us. The pressure's on. We're down to our last $8. It's been difficult to find a place to stay. We've been uh, sleeping in car parks. How does that make you feel? I'm sort of okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, lots of things are falling into place. My main aim is obviously to come up to Darwin and be here with the Hidaki where its birthplace is. It's quite exciting actually. I'd like to sit down and be able to comfortably speak with an elder who is the custodian of the didgeridoo. That really is a big part of my journey. It's an emotional uh, feeling which almost is that going home, that going home finally. Michael and Michelle have now been on the road for 10 months. They've managed to get from Sydney to Darwin in the Northern Territory, but money is tight. Here's to Arnhem Land. I've traveled thousands of kilometers to meet the man who inspired me to do this journey. All I know about him is that he lives somewhere here in Arnhem Land and is the master player of the didgeridoo or Yudaki, as indigenous people call it. They head up towards Gove. To get there, they travel through Jawan and Yongu country, on roads that are impenetrable during the wet season. We've been driving along this dirt track since 8 o'clock this morning, and it's about a 750-kilometer drive of nothing, except bush. There's only one petrol station between Catherine and Gove. To their horror, it's closed which means they're in deep trouble. We're running on empty at about 60 k's out of go, and I um, don't know if I'm going to make it. With two empty tanks, there's no way they're going to make the 60 kilometers to go. No, 
goes past us all day, 750 k's. Michael calculates they have fuel for only another 10 kilometers. So you got the crash before you even get there. Okay, well, let's see I'm just if we can nervous tension because I don't know if we're going to get there. But as each kilometre ticks over, the truck just keeps going. It seems to take on a life of its own. After fueling up in Gove, Michael and Michelle head out of town to settle down for the night. Ooh, what a long drive. Our Taj Mahal was waiting, and we felt blessed by Arnhem Land. Very powerful forces around here. You just wouldn't know just driving by or flying in and then flying out. But it's here. When you speak with the people, they tell you. They tell you how it is here. They check in with the locals to find out if anyone knows the master player of the Yidaki. Mandawa Yunapingu, the lead singer from the famous Australian rock band Yothu Yindi, tells them his name is Jalu Kurawiwi. Mandawai directs them to Jalu, who lives just up the road at Ski Beach. Can you come and say hello, Jalu? This is Jalu. Oh, hello. The mm. custodian of the Yiraki. We're cutting out of there. Yeah. He's a very special man. He is a man that I've travelled a long way from Woo. Mount Everest to come back here to find the custodian of the Yiraki. He uh, makes you feel like you're one. There's no skin colour, there's no language that separates this man. So, uh, yeah, I feel very blessed that I've met him. Jalu offers to make me a special yidaki. Choosing the right tree is critical. Only a master maker knows what to look for so that the yidaki has a clear, sharp, resonating sound. I took it. Out of from my, my life, I gave you. See? Very powerful. Yeah. Jalu is 75 years old, and as the elder and spiritual guardian of the Yudaki, he supervises the community as they make the new instruments. He also ensures that the knowledge is passed down to the next generation. Cultural people, yes. live, from the mystery to history. See? Jalu's Yudakis are highly prized, Owning one of these is like owning a Rolls Royce or a Stradivarius violin. The master. That night is a very special night for me. I am invited to dance with the local community in a bunga bunga or corroboree. I'm definitely not a contender for the Strictly Dancing Awards. This is the customary way to receive a yidaki. He's been adopted by Jalu and into the family and he is family now. Jalu then calls me over and the pressure's on. I'm asked to perform for the whole community. It's showtime for this white fella. I feel Jalu and I now have a spiritual connection forever. The file snake and water lily are Jalu's totems, and Michael is delighted when Jalu paints these spiritual totems on the truck. The men have come through here to do some hunting for kangaroo and also honey. That's why they burn off. They travel west to Arnhem Bay to meet some of Jalu's relatives. Michelle is taken out to learn about traditional hunting and gathering. So start cutting the fuel. This will be interesting. <laughs> Put your back into it. Yeah. Honey hunting. She decides that wood chopping is men's business. Well done, Martin. Thanks for the help. No Doris is looking for a beehive. She's found a small hole in the branch. <laughs> Some, some honey in the tree. These are native bees that don't sting, and their honey is delicious with a distinctive woody taste. Mm. 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 
Thanks for my shirt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The beeswax is used for the mouthpiece cool. of the yidaki. Mm. It's a feed. And good for Michael's yidaki. Yo. Towards the end of the day, Doris and Nancy teach Michelle about their traditional bush remedies. Just stop the pain. Yeah. Mm. Just put them on there. Yeah. Yeah. All of that? Yeah. Can I put them in now? If I don't have a sore tooth, it won't work. <laughs> Be a bit poisonous. Pandanus, but language name? He could look back. It's beautiful. Smell. <laughs> Doris is the fifth of Marawa Ganambara's seven wives. He has a total of 22 children. And some of these kids are extremely talented. The community has no shops, and suppliers come from 200 kilometers away. They hunt traditionally for all their fresh food, as their ancestors did. Ah, deadly! That large herring there was just waiting in the mangroves, and boom, one poke, he's out, there it is, dinner for the night. These are saltwater people, and the shark is their totem. And he's the elder of this area, Dorothy? Yeah. yeah. It is his memory. Yes. <laughs> well, his memory stays with us on the vehicle now. Yeah. Wherever we travel. Jason. <laughs> I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you very much. Journey of discovery. And we'll just go where the road takes us and uh, maybe we'll have to knuckle down somewhere and uh, work in a pub or pull, pull beers to, to put fuel in the tanks. <laughs> because love and passion does not fill the fuel tanks. <laughs> but uh, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there, sure. That'd be great if National Geographic Television came on board. We'll be home and hosed, and Australia and the rest of the world can uh, have the voice from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of which we're filming. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, hit the road. Yeah, let's pack up. Black Pala Magic, um, just in case um, people did not know, is an indigenous band from this part of the world, from here, this land, this country, this water. That's where, that's where Black Water Music is from. We're bringing to the world messages from the past, from our ancestors, through the songs, traditional songs, the singing, the storytelling. We're able to communicate also with the non-indigenous community too, because I believe that the non-indigenous community have a right to know um, what's happening. Mm. Our dream is here, preservation of culture. That culture's been there for countless, countless, countless generations, you know? And we want that culture and that tradition to be there for many, many countless, countless, countless generations to come, you know? We want it to be passed on to the next generations, to our grandchildren, and to our great-great-grandchildren, and so on and on. And what's your message? The message is about unity, being one, preserving and maintaining your, your identity. Identity is very, very important. If you lose your identity, you're nothing. You finish. You are not a person anymore. Our elders have got something to say. It's time for us to listen. <laughs> they arrive at Nikina, where they stop at an indigenous retirement village to say hello to the locals. Some of these elders are the last of Australia's nomads. One hundred and seven. Yeah. You've seen a lot.
Now, you were 100 years old last Saturday. Yeah. And you had all your family give you a big birthday party. Yeah. And you've got three sons and one daughter. Yeah. You're a big mob. Big mob. Yeah. You can take this off now. Yo. Beautiful. Being with the elders reinforces for Michelle how important Indigenous health is. I feel the urgency to um, study Western medicine, um, basically get it over done with, so I can then do ophthalmology and operate on some of these old people that need cataract surgery, and I feel I'm really suited to do that sort of work. We continued on to Broome in northwestern Australia. You know, a professional photographer filmmaker is not permitted in here. So, so that must be hey? us. <laughs> we were lucky to catch up with a real crocodile hunter, Malcolm Douglas, at his croc farm. You got it there? Malcolm has been protecting these ancient dinosaurs since the early 1960s. You know, on the list, what we call the cuddly list, the, the list of animals that people want saved. You know what's on the top? The pandas, the platypus, the koala, the kangaroo. And what's down the bottom that no one wants to save? And this is a registered list, the crocodile. So I felt that no one wanted to save the crocodile, so I will. So I was actually one of the first people in Australia to advocate the protection of the crocodiles. And I've laughed at it in the 90s, oh, sorry, in the 1960s. So it's goodbye to Broome now, Shell. It's goodbye to Broome, the last sunset in WA for us. And um, I'm going to miss it. I just love it up here. And definitely be back. The community here are just really together, really forward in their thinking and very progressive in not only their health organisations, but in the Reconciliation Council. Uh, started from here with Patrick Dodson as the chairperson of that. People like that are of influence and role models for our community uh, live here. They're looking forward to getting out of the truck to set up a new life in the city. Western Australia has its fair share of poisonous snakes. Lucky this one was harmless. <laughs> so they drive the 400 kilometres or so across the Great Sandy Desert, then around another 500 kilometres across the Little Sandy Desert, and then about 1,000 kilometres to get to Woodjuk. You just got off the phone, didn't you, to um, Nima? Mm. What happened? Not much happened, that's why I'm upset. <laughs> A panel of three people um, refused application, so... Why? We're going around having a holiday and we just happen to have a camera in our hands, basically. Is that how they see it? Mm. And they don't feel they can equip the money on our project as well as they could on others. I think because there's only the two of us, there's not a big crew. But, um, Do you think that we're having a holiday? At the moment it's nice, <laughs> but it's Christmas. Christmas season, so... But no, it's been hard work. Bit of a waste, really. Need to go out to university or something. Be a doctor so then I can make money, so then, I, so then we can um, actually afford to do these things. <laughs> at the moment you don't get any support from the people who you're doing it for in the first place. So. Well, good luck, huh? Thank you. Bye. Bye. Michelle hoped to combine her bush medicine knowledge with her medical studies. I edited our documentary and life was good. 
Oh, it's fantastic. At the moment, we're doing the upper limb and the nerves and the nerves that spy the muscles. So it's very interesting, and I'm actually really enjoying this part of first year medicine. Mid year, Michelle is able to go out to Nukumba community to do ophthalmological studies with Dr. Peter Graham. Along with the late Fred Hollows, Peter has spent four decades dealing with the problems of glaucoma and trachoma in remote communities. Two good eyelids. That's the best eyes we've seen all the morning. But there is a little shred of mucus here, if you just look with your magnifiers. Near the bottom, turn over. The technique that Peter Graham and Fred Hollows devised has been used to save the sight of thousands of indigenous people. Thank you, matey. You were terrific. What's your name? South of Perth, they escaped to the land of the Wadundi, where the Central Australian Land Management and Ken Eichenberg have struck a unique deal for this language group. This land was 300 acres in its original form, and there was a rural strategy plan that the government had put forth. And we kind of thought, well, if there's sort of a deal to be done with calm, why couldn't it be done with the local Aborigines who much more deserve the land? Because there's plenty of national park around here. It makes me feel proud of Mr. Eisenberg, what he has done for us to give us back that land. There has to be some bloke from overseas from America that had the land. He said, what? Well, I'll give it back the land to the people that own the land at first. That's very good of him. This is called the Wad Wadan Cultural Centre. Wadan means the old man of the sea. And that's why we get the dolphins and things up there. Because we are now in, a, in the multicultural society that we are living in. And I reckon that, that the reconciliation is not too far away if they only learn to believe in the black man's law. Vilma Webb adds the family's totems to the truck, which is starting to transform into a message stick for the whole of Indigenous Australia. That's why I married her, because she was a good artist. <laughs> <laughs> we head east across the Nullarbor. This is where this car comes on to its own. I love it. We've averaged about 100 kilometres per 40 litres, so worked it out that's probably about two miles per gallon. I don't know if uh, having my foot flat to the floor has anything to do with my mileage with the gallon, but I guess it has a little. Oh, it's a uh, dollar six per litre, which is uh, the most expensive we've had to pay so far. It costs a hundred dollars just to fill two tanks done all that work, I spent all that money rebuilding it and I feel like we've gone backwards. It's just cold and windy and I'm hungry. This is poor man's lunch. Two minute noodles and veggies. Adding insult to injury, at the South Australian border, they have to hand over all their fresh fruit to guard against the fruit fly pest. <laughs> Five dollars worth of our budget. <laughs> Let's go. At least you didn't take our chocolate. <laughs> no fruit flies and chocolate. It's such a long drive across the Nullarbor, it just seemed to go on and on and on. Looks a bit looming, doesn't it? So we pulled off the road early to set up camp, get a fire going, and so we can have some tucker. With very little food, fuel or money, it was a very quiet meal. We're down to our last $65. So we're on our way from Sejuna. They didn't have a credit union there for us to access some money. So we're off to Port Augusta. They withdraw the last of their savings. Michael and Michelle have been invited to the Noosa Film Festival to screen their documentary. Thousand A plus I got a snuggie for $5. Oh, that's OK. <laughs> savings help them get there and they hope to leave with the first prize of $50,000. Welcome to the Noosa Film Festival. Um, first year, I wouldn't miss it. Our documentary is promoting positive aspects of Indigenous Australians today. And basically, in our film, you jump in the front seat of our Land Rover, which was our home and production vehicle for three years, and come around Australia with us. So we're going to take on some producing responsibilities of the project. So Actor Billy Zane, better known for his roles in The Phantom and Titanic, 
puts them up in a luxury hotel for the duration of the festival. I'm flattered to be a part of this. Check this Beautiful, out. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mandawai Yunapingu, lead singer for Yoth Yendi, lent a hand as well. Baru. Baru is a saltwater crocodile from northeast Arnhem Land. It's Munda's totem. It's my signature. The big night arrives. Even though they're up against around 15 documentaries, the media flurry around them lulls them into thinking they're a sure thing. There are only good films there. I am very proud to announce that the Golden Boomerang goes to Malcolm Watson, Raymond Steiner for the cup. We couldn't believe it when it wasn't our doco that won. Shelley, you've been up so long. <laughs> I that we didn't win. No, it's not about winning. You can have all your ideas and everything, but is it worth it? You know, it becomes very. Mm, I really want to be a doctor. I think I should just stick to that. Yeah. This is too fickle and superfluous. You said goodbye. He's always next to you, my love. Yeah. This is upsetting. Are we, are we, Michael? We've done this for how long? And nothing. No, nothing. Soul, nothing, nothing. Nothing. We know how good it is, and lots of people know how good it is, and wonderful it is, and we're good people. It sends a good message. Cheers, Michelle, for, uh, for your hard work, mate. With our naive enthusiasm, given a harsh reality check, we focused on the future. But this is different for each of us. We go our separate ways, and I will now continue the journey alone to Arunda country, Central Australia. The outback is unforgiving. Philip, do you want to tell us what happened here? Uh, Got a flat, huh? Yeah. We're fixing our spare tire back. Yeah, bush mechanic, deadly. <laughs> a little further down the track, Michael has his own problems with a broken throttle cable. Gonna make do. It can be dangerous if you're on your own and not well equipped. But Michael's ensured he has a good supply of food and water. Don't you ever let me get you down. The truck has not yet been to Central Australia. Colin Wallangari McCormack, who first painted the original rainbow serpent on the vehicle, has invited Michael to the Yipirinya Festival. You are about to witness the biggest demonstration of Indigenous ceremony ever performed in this country. They have come here to dance on our land and represent their nations. They bring their law, their dance, their song, and their spirit to share with us all today. It's uh, hard to sort of comprehend uh, this big journey after six years and not having Michelle here. But uh, as you can see behind me, all the dancers are getting ready for one of the biggest robberies in Australia's history. I'm with Nyunga, so I'm, uh, we've been dancing for years in Nyunga country. And, uh, um, it's, it's good to come here because we, we run into a lot of old people we've been dancing with for over some 30 years. For us, it's really good because I think that a lot of our younger people are starting to realise how strong culture is. And these events make them really stronger still and they look forward to do more future presentations. People are drawn to the vehicle to lend a hand in creating a modern day indigenous message stick. It's all happening. It's uh, one of those occasions which I really wanted this all to happen and it just transpires like this. So it's a special moment for this car. And now it goes to the National Museum of Australia. I think what's happened here on this weekend is just unbelievable. This um, event here, in terms of reconciliation, tells everybody what's alive and well and how successful it has been with um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people coming together with the non-Indigenous people in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As the festival continues, so do the totems and Dreamtime stories. 
Traditionally, this was a stick carried by Aborigines as they traveled across the land. The symbols of different language groups gave them access to country that wasn't their own. The National Museum of Australia is the perfect place to show all of Australia about this rich and colourful culture. Finest ochre in the world. Where does it come from? Central Australia. Very sacred. So it's the first time we've used it on a special occasion and to paint a, a great icon of our country, Mr Gough Whitlam. This message stick, <laughs> this motorised message stick, a 21st century equivalent of an ancient practice, is an important reminder of the significance of communication and understanding between the various groupings of Indigenous and subsequent Australians. On that, I'd like to invite Mundawai up to the stage and I'd like to play a little bit of Yudaki. And if he could maybe just sing a small song, that would be fantastic. <laughs> like a storybook. I'm part of that storybook now. It's a great initiative. Then the vehicle travels back to where it all began, Eora country in Sydney. I might say that Jack's like my father, hey. the father I never had. Hey, I'm like the father I never had. <laughs> <laughs> this vehicle is a representative of the attitude of we who have come to live in this land, coming to know something of this indigenous culture and its journey around Australia symbolizes that and is emblematic of the meeting of the two cultures. In the very heart of Sydney is where I by chance meet Samantha Martin. She is working in the corporate world, but inside is the fabric of a young, beautiful and intelligent traditional Aboriginal woman. She invites me along to a photographic shoot with photographer Peter Steele. He wants to enter Samantha's image and her Aboriginal culture into the prestigious Archibald Art Awards. What we actually want is just that down the bottom. Just down the bottom, yeah. That's when I see a different side of Samantha unfold. With this bloodline running I'm through my veins, call, I, I saw this as a long. great opportunity to express myself through the eyes of a camera. I stand proud for my culture, promoting Aboriginal awareness to the world. Michael and Samantha organized the Hands of Peace launch at the Touch of Mandela Gallery at The Rocks in Sydney. We welcome it in the spirit of Mandela, a spirit of freedom, a spirit of democracy, um, and a spirit of integrity. So it's with this that I thank you all for coming. I hope you have a wonderful night. And it's with this that we bless this beautiful vehicle and this beautiful voice. So thank you very much. They were honored to have Mr. Nelson Mandela's handprints on the vehicle, holding Africa in the palm of his hands. You complain that you walk home alone. Samantha has invited me to go back home with her to meet her family in the Kimberleys, Western Australia. It was great to see how proud she was of the messy stick vehicle and what it truly represented for her people. And sometimes when you call out my name, I wonder if I was her, would you call it the
After arriving back in Larrakia country in Darwin, Samantha and Michael tracked down two famous artists to paint their traditional stories on the vehicle while being exhibited at the Northern Territory Museum. Jardi Ashley is an artist from the Yolngu clan in central Arnhem Land who paints the Wagalug sisters. So our motto phrase on this vehicle that it was built for war, yeah. now rebuilt for peace. Yeah. It was used for sick and dying yeah. and now for the healing of our nation. So you, you feel the spirit? Yeah, in this my car? spirit will be there. Yeah. Yeah. And what did you paint? What did you paint on the car? You uh, want to tell your story? Two sisters. Two yeah, sisters. two Wagalug sisters. They've been painting language. They didn't speak my lingo, then Wagala. When you see this car, what is it that you feel? It makes me feel proud. It tells the story about a little bird that did the creation. It's the black and white bird, Peewee. And then what we call it, Dear Dear. And then we told these ladies that was ready for harvesting. Well, thank you so much, Jenna. It's beautiful. <laughs> We're on the Stuart Highway and uh, it's good to get out of Darwin with Sam and we're on our way after seven years of her not seeing her mum to go and visit her so we're really looking forward to that. It's good to be on the road again with a landy! not looking too good. Have a look under. Well, she's pretty buggered. I've um, broken off the axle right where the drum brakes are and she's not going anywhere. And you're in a bit of shock, aren't you? Yes, I am. Got a bit of a fire there too. We did. I thought she was going to go up in flames. No, she we... wouldn't be good. No. The tow truck finally arrived from Catherine 500 kilometers away and they were looking at another five hours on the road to get back to Catherine. Russell, the driver, has been really cautious on placing this on. A bit of a difficult job, but we've got her on and now we'll find out what the problem is when we get back to uh, Catherine tomorrow morning, so we'll follow. Okay, here we are at the workshop. We've been able to um, get the parts for the landy. Well, there it is. I'm all finished doing the mechanics on the truck. She's ready to go again. Just put the wheel on. It's all good. The Landy will run again. Welcome to the Kimberleys. It is Hello. quarantine time. Yes, we are. Fruit, vegetables, honey seeds, and plants on board. No. This is a serious procedure to guard against unwanted travelling <laughs> bugs and insects from entering the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Well, welcome to WA, Sam. Yeah, finally. <laughs> it's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a long journey, seven years of it. Yeah, people just see my family and my mum now. After growing up in the most remote area of Australia, I can truly say this country is alive. The main source of fresh water comes from Lake Argyle, built in 1972. It is the largest body of inland water in Australia and is home to freshwater crocodiles, rock wallabies, lizards and over 60 species of birds. The wet season is between November and April, but they arrive in the Kimberleys during the driest time of the year in September, with temperatures reaching 45 degrees Celsius. cattle station and I learned how to survive in the outback 
in its rugged and intimidating landscape. Wyndham was forced into existence in the late 1800s by a gold rush, with over 5,000 migrant miners landing on the shores. It is the last frontier and one of the most remote, isolated and exciting towns in this region. With no traffic lights and a population of 2,000 people, the large crocodile hints at how prolific the reptiles are in this area. It was built by Samantha's brother, Fred Martin, in 1989. How did I ever live in the big smoke for seven years? Being the youngest daughter of 10, I felt the importance to be educated and to be an example of promoting our culture for the next generation. My eldest sister Jean was the first to greet me with open arms. Here we are at the Wyndham Crocodile Farm. A few years ago I actually worked here and um, we're just coming back for a visit to show Michael where I used to work and to see some of the biggest crocs in the northeast Kimberley. I hear you used to um, not only feed the crocs but uh, have a little bit of a trick with a uh, blackberry. Yes, well it's actually a pebble and um, there's a test and a bit of a joke with the farmers that um, test your courage and there's an old croc, I don't know if he's still alive, but his name's Angus and he's with his mouth open. So what you do is have to put a pebble in his mouth and that shows your bravery. But what I did was I put a pebble in his mouth, but I also took it off as well. So I thought I was pretty dumb. <laughs> I thought I was pretty cool. Millions of others would too. Oh well. Lucky you got two arms left. I don't know what Sam was thinking, but she's a crazy girl. I worked at the croc farm for seven months and learned a lot about these amazing ancient dinosaurs. Oh, look at him, he's beautiful. Funny, I'm scared of snakes, but not crocs, huh? Yeah, off the top. Beautiful skin. I taste the big, salty, big umbagari. These crocodiles can grow up to six metres, or 20 feet long and live in the muddy rivers that Samantha used to swim in. Beautiful smell. As a little girl, I used to pretend that this was my makeup, my blush, and I'd go and get the real fluffy ones and put it on my cheeks. And I'd walk inside and I'd have all yellow streaks of pollen all over me and mum would say, what's going on with you? Let's pretend that I was a model. She goes, go and wash your face. Here I am today. Mm, take a trip down memory lane. I love it. They drove 200 kilometers south of Wyndham into the night to reach Doon Doon Station. I feel kind of nervous, very nervous. It is a small Aboriginal operated community where Samantha's mother lives. I knew after seven years that this would be an emotional time for Sam. After seven years of not seeing my mother, I couldn't hold back the tears. Hello. <laughs> Good to meet you. I was proud to finally be introduced to the great Nancy Martin. The next day we travelled out to Pandanus Pool in the heart of the Kimberleys. We came across a big goanna and Sam had me chase him into the scrub. She said, quick, he's good tucker. By the time I caught up with him, he took one look at me and I think I was going to be his good tucker. It was wonderful being back in the water holes I swam in as a little girl. The outback offers a different lifestyle than the city, but I feel quite at home in both worlds. It's yummy. Fresh out of the river. Straight in the coals. Straight in your mouth. Yeah, I do. These little black brim fish are delicious. 
It was great to see Sam so relaxed being back home with her family. With the temperature soaring above 45 degrees, these waterholes are such a welcome relief, but it was time to head off. How was that, sweetie? Yeah, it was awesome. It was absolutely gorgeous. Great to be in your country. Oh, it certainly is. Thank you for inviting me. You're it was welcome. just beautiful, and all the mob are ready to go by the looks. We are! Yay! Yay! <laughs> Thank you, great spirit. Storm's on its way. These dirt roads may look dry, but with the rain fast approaching, we could easily get stuck out here. <laughs> this is my beautiful mother, Nancy Martin, Nancy Dorothy Martin. Were you surprised? <laughs> Did we surprise you? <laughs> no, I didn't even know you more was coming. I was surprised because the house was dirty when you more came. Oh, I didn't even But normally do you twitch onto these things and know that daughter is coming? Yeah. Because when Bronwyn came, my my left side nipple was <laughs> tickling, but it didn't happen for Sam. Because hmm. I was switching off all my channels, didn't want you to know. My mum and I have a very incredible close connection, and it's great to know that Michael and I surprised her. To me, she wins Mother of the Year award hands down raising nine of her own children and four adopted kids. Sam's done an incredible amount of work with this vehicle, so it's a real privilege to have her whole family on the vehicle now. Thank you, Michael. I love this truck and I love what it stands for, so I, my work is to represent all of Australia and my family comes with me, so it's really important that I feel that they're with me and protecting me and guiding me through this journey. My elders are also watching over me as my traditional spirit guides. With a beautiful smile and a blessing, Samantha now feels content knowing that all her family's handprints are on the message stick vehicle. It doesn't take long before the Bush Telegraph lets people know Samantha Martin is back in town. Auntie Peggy Patrick is a senior Gidja law woman and has the leadership role of ceremonial and country responsibilities for the Warman community and Argyle Diamond Mine. This is a very emotional time for them both. Auntie Peggy was responsible for educating Samantha when she was five years old with traditional singing, dance and language from the tribe. Peggy continues to pass on her traditional knowledge to the younger generation to protect and honour the culture. She taught me how to dance when I was a little girl and has always remained in my heart. Oh, now you never forget me. She's been talking about you all the time, Auntie Peggy. Oh, uh, your teacher with them in the school. I read this ochre. That. This form of ochre rock is crushed up and turned into a powder. A river tree sap is used to bind it with a small amount of water. The rich colours of red, yellow and brown depict the sacred stories of the land and its people. This process has been passed down for thousands of years and is still used today. Samantha and Michael were then invited into the Warman Art Gallery all this authentic artwork expresses the land where I come from, such as the bungle bungles and sacred sites. What a great moment for me with the beautiful woman I love. When I open my eyes and see the sunrise, I'm thinking of your face. My sister Yvonne Martin then painted the sacred sites of the Barramundi Dreaming. Millie Martin paints the Pernalulu or Bungo Bungles. I think we're taking this one home. I think so. 
So I've just gotten up, the sun's just coming up, it looks absolutely beautiful. It's time for us to leave Dun Dun. Well, all good things come to an end. After being away for seven years and only spending seven days with my family, I wasn't quite ready to say goodbye. The last time I saw my nieces and nephews, they were very little, and now they're all grown up. What would they look like the next time I saw them? Meeting all of Sam's family, in particular Nancy, made me too feel like I was part of her family. Holding back the tears was very difficult. But when the reality hit me of when would I see my family again, well, the tears just came streaming out. The last thing Nancy said to me was, take good care of my daughter. And I said, it would be my honour. The last words my mother said to me was, you are a strong woman, Sam. You shouldn't be crying. But you need to remember, I will always love you. This journey has taught me many things of love, understanding and culture. That's in her own backyard and Samantha took me right into the heart of her amazing way of life. As we drove along the Great Northern Highway, there were so many things I wish I had have said to my mother, but it was too late. I sat and watched the colours of the land change and was grateful for the wonderful experience of revisiting my country, my family and my people. I know what I need to share with the rest of the world, the richness, the gratitude of land and creation, the ability to live and survive the changes of time, and the fact that we were here a long time ago, and we're here to stay. And to share this with you is what my culture is about. We've got the David Hudson. He did a medicine wheel, and we took that um, medicine wheel around the country. We carve hands here, we just do a nice story line there. Come down over here, just follow them down, story line. What, what do you mean the story line? What does that well, mean? Well, you know, if you get rubbing around with this, this is the, the carve hand. Speaking of hands, you've got a handprint and a signature here. Well, that was done in 1995, so that's 20 years ago. It's held up. I've got to hand it to you. <laughs> well, here we are. The message stick uh, ends up going to Sydney to be auctioned off at Theodore Bruce Fine Art Auction House in Sydney. It's been uh, quite a journey thus far to see the vehicle take so many different journeys in its life and this is there but another one but possibly to a new owner. I'm really excited but also a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit melancholy that uh, the car will be sold. After nearly 10 years on the road, this moving canvas for Indigenous culture, showcased in museums across Australia, has reached the end of its journey for now. The message stick vehicle will go under the hammy in Sydney on September 10th. Hayley Francis, We News. Yes, well we have the, we're fortunate enough to have the message stick vehicle, so uh, as being an Aboriginal art consultant, I'm always on the lookout for things that are unique and capture the spirit of Aboriginality and uh, I was lucky enough to see this particular vehicle that had come up at a Sydney auction. Ladies and gentlemen, lot number 160 is the message stick vehicle. Um, I, I, don't, I, I really don't know what to say about it, it's absolutely <laughs> fabulous isn't it? Um, here it is, it's, um, it's travelled around Australia, it, is, um, uh, it has got some very interesting names and artwork on it including Gough Whitlam, Ian Thorpe, we've got Paddy Fordham, we've got a whole range of people. Um, and it has just been a, um, a wonderful vehicle. Uh, so we, we offer it, as you see it, ladies and gentlemen, and it's um, a great opportunity to have a bit of history, um, not to mention a vehicle. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's get it underway. Where should we start? Anyway, with the stroke of luck, we were able to secure the vehicle, and it'll uh, stay in our gallery as a permanent fixture and continue to draw lots of attention, I believe.
I think for me it was just really fantastic to bring together a lot of Indigenous Australia on the one vehicle. It represents so much of Australia through its art, through its storytelling and through the journey that I actually took. There's virtually nowhere in Victoria you can go to see works like this, especially of this scale. And all, as you know, all the works in this room are a, an aspect of uh, message. So it fits in perfectly with what we're trying to achieve and we'll be exposed to thousands of people uh, per annum and lots of children and lots of Indigenous people. So I think it's uh, in, in a perfect position to uh, capitalise on what it was actually set out to do in the first place. I'm so happy to see this vehicle go on display in such a, a beautiful environment and continue to tell its story, the Mississippi vehicle.